Colin Heron, Senior Water Resources Management Specialist at the Global Water Partnership, and Jin Tanaka, Branch Manager at UNISC International, spoke to our Thrive community about ensuring access and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. Their talks were part of June's SDG 6 theme on clean water and sanitation. After their presentations, our presenters kindly took questions from the audience. So just have a look at the, some of the questions I've got uh, that have been forwarded to me. Uh, I have here one, which uh, if we like to start off with for Colin, uh, this is from uh, Aidan Hassan, hopefully I got the name correctly. He's a manager of Ocean Water Well Drilling Company in Somalia. He's in our audience uh, this evening. His question is related to um, Somalia has affected, uh, is affected by greatly by droughts due to lack of rain and there is no much effort from government or NGOs and United Nations partners to help out those affected by those droughts. So his question or his observation is that there is a challenge and a gap uh, in terms of collaboration between local government and United Nations donors or partners. So I guess looking for you to comment, uh, Colin, uh, if you will. Yeah, thanks, Morris, and thanks, Sadan, for the very good question. Um, I have to say that in 2017, when the world first evaluated how well it was doing uh, with IWRM, Somalia was the was bottom of the class in some ways. It, it evaluated itself as having 10 percent towards the the 2030 target of 100 uh, percent. That did improve um, between 2017 and 2020. Um, I don't have the latest figure on hand. I can just check that shortly, but I think it was about uh, 20%, if I'm not mistaken. So the country is improving, but it's far from ideal. Um, and I think what the, the issue you've pointed at, Adam, is exactly what a not very good implementation of IWRM is that the, um, the, the different bodies in charge of water aren't necessarily coordinating that the funding schemes aren't flowing. Um, and we, in fact, have recently uh, supported a lot of efforts in Somalia to um, increase just basic understanding and capacity of water resources challenges. Um, uh, that's been done with the World Bank and UNDP and UNEP. Um, so we realized that each country is at a slightly different starting point. Uh, but Somalia, I have to say, in particular with the drought that's really affecting it right now, I, I think it, it's it's a country and a region in Eastern Africa that really requires uh, concerted support from both, I would say, the international community, but also there needs to be a, a very solid basis within the national government. Because otherwise, and we've seen cases of this in the past where international support is provided, but then the government priorities change and a lot of that funding is then not necessarily sustainable. And that's what we need to avoid above all else in countries that really need it, like Somalia. Thanks. All right. Uh, thanks. Um, thanks for that. Uh, I have a question here for, for Jin. Um, uh, again, many thanks for your presentation, uh, the uh, participant says. and. He's looking at, um, you highlighted uh, it is so important to provide comprehensive information um, that young people will find useful in focusing their efforts to contribute to taking effective action in water management. So they're just wondering how easy you have found to counter the various barriers to knowledge sharing that you identified. So this is referring back to your presentation, uh, Jin, would you like to go ahead? Okay, thanks so much. I'm going to uh, share to the, some of the example presentation for you. And nowadays, uh, to share the knowledge, it's most harder because most of the members uh, cannot do the share to the, some knowledge and share the information. And that time we introduced it to the Kankyo Cafe method of the environmental dialogue to, make it, to enhance the mutual understanding. And that time we do the, some of the dialogue kind of some the subject is need, I mean kind of subject for the talking water, but no conclusions, but purpose is exploring for diversity. So I'm taking the relationship of the equals as we uh, go back to the, the um, force between issues, kind of issues of waters, and new perspective, open up to the something new and creative as well. And also the, the, this is not only finding something, but also knowing the relationship between something and something else. 
for the waters. And knowing the clarify for the meaning of the things, furthermore, understanding a value of the things. And that time, we're going to the pile of the, the many old knowledge or the emphasis. Like it's information and based on some of the information about the waters, and we also ask him uh, quite a, uh, some experience and get the knowledge and more experience for the individuals and others and getting wisdom for some visions, evaluation, and discretions. Also, for the he's using to the, some of the Kankyo Cafe on, online, we do it. And for the uh, once in a Three times in a week, we uh, every day we did in the Asia Pacific countries and try to get uh, try to get as many use like uh, to the, every week we got uh, more than one hundred uh, use for getting some uh, joined to this kind of program and try to get the understanding for the the most important information and the, some of the research information we're going to provide with connecting to the researchers on online and they can get the more correct, uh, correct and detailed information in English for the, the waters and for the, the issues of the waters. So that um, we did. Yeah, okay, thanks uh, for that, uh, Jin. Um, I see that you're uh, suggesting a multiple different methods, which is uh, good to hear. Um, looking uh, across here, another question I have uh, for Colin. Um, as you've highlighted uh, so effectively, given the centrality of water in attaining all the SDGs, uh, is there an evidence of a positive flow on effect, whereby making sustained progress on SDG 6 has also contributed to achieving one or more of the other SDGs? So uh, a flow on effect from improving the situation around SDG 6. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, what we've done is correlate the human development index against uh, SDG 6.5.1 progress. And we can see that there is a pretty neat alignment between how developed a country is and how well it's managing its water resources. Um, it's very difficult to dissect what is cause and effect, right? But if you look at countries like Japan, like Sweden, where I live, um, they are all towards the upper echelons, I would say, in terms of water management, but also in terms of, uh, you know, sustainable development and human development more broadly. Um, in terms of, I would say, more granular information and, and sort of case studies, I would say um, that it's it's still very early to, to point to some of the activities that we've supported, for example. And I would love to be able to do that and say, you know, in 2017, we supported this. And in 2020, uh, we can see that they're much more advanced on the SDG 6.5, but also on, you know, some of the other SDG targets um, related to water resources. But I also want to avoid getting to any early conclusions, which my the team that I have working with me to raise funds hate me for because they say, no, I, I don't care. Give me the numbers. Uh, but I, I think that we have to be, Morris, as you said at the very outset, we have to be very science-based about this and, and methodological. Um, so at this stage, it's more anecdotal evidence that better water resources management does lead to broader you know, development. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we can't really point to any specific examples more than anecdotally. Right, okay. Uh, thanks for that. Um, similar uh, in Thrive Project, uh, we also have a similar situation that uh, uh, you know, good advice may result in better action, but is just that good advice was the one that uh, uh, brought people over the line, or is there a variety of other things that contribute? And we live in an uh, interconnected world with so much information flowing around, so it's hard to really pinpoint it down to, to just one thing. Uh, but thanks for that answer. Uh, Jin, I have another question here uh, for you, which relates back to, to your uh, country. It says, what are the technologies used in Japan in uh, to collect garbage in the water resources? So looking at things like the sea, rivers, and obviously the ocean. Um, yeah, what would you say to, uh, to that one, Jin? Okay, thanks so much. Thanks for asking those questions. I'm going to introduce some good examples for you. The TV, and now I'm showing you, uh, this is based on the information of the news, and they're going to the, automatically collecting the, all, all the, the garbage uh, from the oceans and rivers. Here is one of the, deep, uh, one of the, one of the lakes, uh, it's expanded about to the, uh, about to the uh, 10 kilometers, uh, half a ways, and they're going to put into the, this kind of the 
these kinds of machines we are using to the automatically and yes, like this, just cross to the, the coast and they put the, the garbage, they put the machines into the, uh, and, uh, and just only to the turning onto the, 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 the machines. And after that, let's, let's, let's you can see. So they take, uh, get the, the garbage and try to sanitize and so takes away to the to the, the outside or the some clean waters and takes the takes it, take into the more garbage and uh, into the, the into the bucket and takes away to the waters and takes out so many times and you, you can see just two or three days later you can see this one. And most of the some of the garbages and the floating floating some uh litters, litters, we can correct this more easily and just change the bag uh, garbages, make it uh, and we can correct them more. And so as a maximum, we're going to correct to the, the two, 20 kilograms and per one garbages. And we can so get to the mini. Me plastics and the many other kinds of some uh, less than five meters plastic, uh, plastic liters microplastic, and we can also collect it. All right. So also looking so at like this. Uh, and yeah, we also, also in, uh, try to introduce the, these uh, these liters into the some local government and local companies and so on. Yeah, so also looking at addressing microplastics, I, I see there as well. Um, there's uh, someone in the chat who's asking for the link. Could you share the link uh, to that YouTube video that you just shared with us? I think they want to have a closer look at that. Um, thanks yes, for that. I provide now. Okay, thank you. Um, moving along with time here. I have a question for Colin. Um, this is uh, a bit of a lengthy question, but let's see if I can get this out. Um, so looking at the importance of SDG 6, uh, as we're doing this evening, um, in relation to, well, they mentioned Ghana here specifically, but I think they're talking about the mining industry or the illegal mining industry uh, in general. Uh, how it you know, leads to uh, heavy uh, deforestation and pollution of water bodies, uh, increased uh, turbidity and heavy metals concentration in water sources, which makes water treatment expensive and causes shortages of water in several parts of, uh, of the world. Um, so government is, is currently trying to uh, try a series of afforestation programs to curb this menace. Uh, and the question was, is this enough? He's referring to specifically to Ghana, but perhaps you could think of this as a more generic question and, and provide us your thoughts on this. Yeah, it's a very good question and it's a huge challenge, which obviously affects water resources, but goes much beyond that, which is uh, the point I was making, obviously, in my presentation that many sectors interact with water resources both positively and negatively and they, they should be involved uh, in water management schemes. Of course illegal mining activities, uh, one of the real problems there is the lack of enforcement uh, of the legal framework and that is something we see very often uh, across the world where according to law something shouldn't happen but still it does happen. Um, I would say well first um, the, the conservationist in me would, would uh, always say that reforestation rather than afforestation programs are uh, advantageous. I mean, reforestation being putting trees back where they were previously rather than afforestation, which refers to putting trees where they weren't originally, um, always respecting the na native uh, ecology. But really, the situation that you describe in Ghana, uh, it, it seems that it's a it's like you have a huge gaping wound and you're putting a, a, a small plaster or a Band-Aid over it. Um, and it, it, I would say, without knowing the particular case, but the afforestation programs certainly don't seem to be enough. Um, the I would say, I mean, stronger legal measures should be taken there, including criminal measures for the mining activities, which is often difficult because there are entrenched interests, uh, economic and political sometimes, which go against the rule of law. 
and that is one of the, the tragedies of the commons um, because it's an activity that really affects uh, our shared resources. Um, I would say, I mean, that the, the, the easy solution <laughs> from an environmental perspective would be to, you know, stop all mining activities there that are happening illegally. But that's not an easy solution, uh, you know, socially, I would say, and politically to implement. Um, but uh, in any case, it, environmentally, I mean, if there are heavy metals uh, getting into the source, then, then that is a, a serious contamination problem which, which requires you know stringent treatment measures to be taken um, uh, both nature-based solutions could be part of the solution but there you would also probably need a very stringent tertiary treatment uh, and even to remove heavy metals from surface water is is extraordinarily difficult um, even worse from groundwater so it's not an easy problem and uh, I, I think the my message would always be to try to stop this at the source just by having a, um, a clearer enforcement of the legal frameworks where this is always going to be illegal, but we need the uh, the police, I mean, to do their, their job in that, in that case. All right, thanks for that. Uh, I have uh, uh, another maybe uh, uh, more broader one here for you, Colin. Uh, what would you highlight as some of the pressing challenges for implementing water management projects or activities alongside uh, government uh, counterparts? So looking at, say, maybe top two or three highlights here. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I probably shouldn't say this, but uh, I will. Um, working with the government sometimes is not easy. You know, um, it's, it's a necessary evil. Uh, I would almost say depending on which government, but sometimes it's like going to the dentist. You know you have to do it, but it's not always uh, something you look forward to. Um, it, many challenges. Uh, in some countries, the change of government really changes the complete landscape of the country. Politically, I've seen so many very good projects that were established in one country with one government. Then the, the head of government changes and the project completely gets deleted from history and and that is really counterproductive. So that is, I would say, one of the biggest challenges we face. Um, the most, I would say, advanced countries tend to have a vision of state, not of government. So where there's a commitment from all of society to achieve these longer term objectives. So even if a government changes, the, the project or the, the intention or the ambition remains. And that's, I think, what we need to uh, get to. Um, of course, there are also issues around resource efficiency. I mean, uh, governments sometimes, you know, that they are bureaucracies. They are set up to manage, but often from most of our government agencies were set up uh, more than 100 years ago. And I think one of the challenges we have nowadays is that um, Many institutions were established with a different logic and a different uh, understanding of our natural resources than we have nowadays. So there's a need to make our institutionality uh, much more flexible and adaptive to the changing circumstances that we know nowadays. Um, if we don't get that right, then it will be very difficult to reach most of the sustainable development goals by 2030. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well. Well, um, I, I, this sort of type of issue is not unique to obviously SDG six. Um, having uh, support by by uh, governments, industry, etc., is uh, especially governments is hard when you know there's a maybe there might be a revolving door situation. The government is changing every few years, uh, and even when a government comes into power, by the time an actual program gets implemented, it's about time that the term is about to change. And everything goes out the window. I mean, you just have to look at the situation with like the Paris Agreement in the US in, in recent times, right? Uh, by the time the government, you know, the government changed, they got out of it. By the time the government changed again, they got like 20 days grace and they went back onto it again. So, I mean, this is sort of typical of what goes on. So, so yeah, uh, indeed an important point. 
Yeah. Can I just add to that? Um, yeah, that sure. Despite my accent, I'm actually a Brit and a Mexican, and uh, the I worked a lot with the Mexican government for a long time, and the Mexican government changes every six years, and typically within those six-year periods, the, the first year is always about planning. So you know that projects are not going to get uh, started during that time. It's it's more about undoing what the previous government did and rewriting history, I would say. Um, then the, the next four years, typically you can get something done. And because everyone knows in the last year of government that everyone is going to change, no civil servant at a high level will remain in their position or very few exceptions for the next six year period. So typically the next, the, the last year of every six years is really about uh, preparing the exit strategy for the civil servants. So really you have a four year window every six years where you can really make some progress. And the objective is to really make sure that that progress can't be undone by the next civil servants that come along, which is a huge challenge. The best way we found of doing that is by having a multi-stakeholder group that supports this, because it's much more difficult politically for a new government to come in and to undo what the private sector, what the international organizations, what civil society and what academia are really uh, bought into and supporting actively. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, lucky you, you, you're looking at a six-year cycle. In a lot of other parts of the world, you're looking at a four-year cycle, some places even a three-year. So by the time you, you cut off the bookends, there's not much left in the, in the middle to work with. But I um, appreciate your response there. Um, Jin, uh, I have a question here for you. Uh, how to advocate youth in rural areas who uh, lack awareness and knowledge? Okay, thanks for good uh, giving the great uh, questions. For the rural areas, uh, we're going to the, provide to the, some of the materials. We send into the to the some of the education materials. I'm also the now member of the UNESCO SDG for youth for the focusing about to the to the uh, provide some education materials in rural areas, which includes some information of the water and the time. Uh, we're going to share to some of the sending some stuff with the, any other organizations for the talking mentioning about the to the issues of the waters and issue of the strongly connected agriculture and issue for the supply chain because other rural areas has a strong industries for the agriculture and strong industry for the fishing. So we're going to provide to the some of the education materials strongly linkage to their lifestyle and habitat and their industries and try to get some awareness. And we also try to uh, some, uh, supply as a UNESCO international uh, organizations. We also supply to the some internet connections. We are providing to the African, North African countries and the, some of the Asian countries, and try to improve the internet connection more well. well. And that time, we also provide to some online invitations to join to some seminars and lessons and, ses uh, and sessions for the get engaged uh, get engaged kind of the, some environmental dialogues and some major understanding of the webinars for the collecting some of the, the expertise for the measuring the oceans and the water management. Right, okay. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, when you, you say providing information in, in sort of which format, and I see actually a question of one of the audience member asking, uh, what technology could be harnessed to, to ensure, uh, they say sustainability. Uh, my question is actually the piece you just mentioned now about educating those in areas or just don't have access, wouldn't normally know the information. So uh, how to get that information out to them? Are we talking electronically online? Are we talking through you know, programs on the ground, etc.? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Okay, thanks so much. Nowadays, I am handing to the Ghana for the, the, the problem some information about it. For the Oh, sorry. Uh, now I have uh, some of the information for the box of the information. Uh, so still be writing onto the to some of the textbook and some of the materials to write on and to write with, and also the sending to the some of the, the box box of the Wi-Fi. And uh, now I have it. Uh, I got this one. So here's the box and the, some of the materials. Wait, some of the materials I have it to kind of get uh, some practical change, like the practice to the, like the European ones and, and the... So these, um, Jin, if I could just ask you, because I can't quite see what you're holding up. 
Are these like uh, materials like uh, in the form of like a game sort of type of thing? What what is it exactly that? Uh, oh yeah. Of so the, yeah, this kind of also some uh, card games. Yes, card games. Okay. But yeah, card games for the enhancing to the SDGs. Uh, it's getting to the some uh, games for the so how they can improve to the economical and social profit and environmental profit, and try to get the exchange to the cards to improve to the knowledge and what they can take actions with with doing to the to the game. I want to show you as well. And what's your uh, uh, and and also some technologies right? you mentioned about this, right? Uh, yeah, I was asking about technology. Um, yeah. I if I could just follow on for what um, what you just mentioned there. Um, a follow on question from this is from one of the other audience members saying about social media, uh, mm -hmm. how it can play a role, uh, a positive role in fostering youth engagement in terms of water governance and and management. Do you have any sort of practical examples of things that have been done in this regard? That question was for Jin. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you like, I'll give you a little bit of time to think about it. I think Colin has something to, to say or to add. Would you like to go ahead? Okay, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Maurice. I, I just wanted to add that I find, uh, and I, not just me personally, but the Global Water Partnership, we find that it's important on in regarding youth participation to tackle the issue from the two sides. One is the sort of mobilization of young people towards water issues, which Jean has also mentioned. And the second is really the environment, the enabling environment, which allows mobilized young people to really contribute to water resources management. And that is the difficult challenge to, to overcome, but uh, it's one that we're, we're trying to achieve through uh, mentoring programs uh, where we're supporting young people to get access to the institutions, working with those institutions to make sure that they are actually listening to the young people uh, who are empowered, therefore, uh, to be agents of change. Because often we find that uh, if uh, an institution is not really buying into the logic of uh, fully empowering young people, then their participation may end up being more tokenistic than anything else, which is a real shame. And that's what we need to avoid. So I think it's, it's from the two sides of the um, that we need to tackle this, this huge challenge. Right, OK. Um, I have a question here for, for Colin. Uh, from the integrated water resource management perspective, could you please give some examples of strategies that can be used to protect water from industrial waste? So in reference to industrial waste. Yeah, I mean, very often the, the, the first strategy is just in applying the law that exists in a country. Uh, and it seems like a, a very simple thing to say, but of course it's very difficult in practice. Um, but nearly every country will uh, have legal frameworks where uh, industries should be treating their water to a certain level before discharging it into a, a water body. But the, the thing that most countries struggle with is the monitoring and enforcement of that. Um, again, I'm going to give the example of Mexico, but uh, there are nationwide about 700,000 registered water users, uh, not all of them industrial, of course, but uh, for the country, last time I checked, there were six uh, inspectors who were check checking on the use in terms of uh, intake and outtake of uh, uh, of water for those 700,000 users. So, I mean, this is something that a lot of industrial users would uh, not necessarily get checked, uh, even if they are discharging. Um, and sometimes the legal frameworks that exist uh, as punishment when a company has been found to be discharging, for example, untreated wastewater um, are such that it's easier for a company to consider doing that financially rather than actually upgrading its infrastructure and, and uh, you know, doing what the law dictates. So I, I think legal mechanisms are one of the most important that we really should be insisting on. Otherwise, it gets very difficult to have a rule of law and our water resources are often 
the um, I mean the, the 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 victim I would say of uh, these actions which shouldn't happen, but unfortunately we are we as society are allowing to happen. Right. Okay. Thanks for that, uh, Colin. Uh, Jin, uh, I have a question here related to youth. Uh, when we look at the world over youth, uh, seems mm -hmm. to be rather, yeah, uh, in relation to youth, seems to be rather getting educated and well informed. Um, I'm just paraphrasing a little here. How this technology or intergeneration could drive the enthusiasm for water conservation? So how can the current uh, 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 youth uh, be, I guess, persuaded or even drive the interest in uh, water conservation? Good question. So nowadays, we, we're going to the improve to the, some of the information and technologies. And most of the last time we doing to the, some of the providing the education materials and so providing the information to break through to the, the, the barriers or the information. And next step, we go, I'm, I'm planning to, the, to get uh, some microfinance. Like, so like it's looking up to the, uh, some of the, the grabbing bank in India. I know, in Bangladesh for the supporting to the, the many information and financial technology to improve and to innovate. And also I like to the, uh, also for the, my, my predictions is like, a, I predict that the youth going to be the helping to the, some technologies and based on the, their, their lives. Likewise to the, here, we have the, some of the uh, plastic bottles and which is usually floating into the, the rivers. That time we're going to the, the ask them to the, how they can collect or how they can grasp. And also that we now are uh, having to the, some trainings for the providing to the, the, some card games and board games. Here I'm going to share again, kind of the card games and providing to the, some of the real materials to uh, to innovate or to get the programming and to get the, some of the ideas, how they can uh, realize to the, their ideas. Uh, it isn't su suitable for your answer? Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Thanks for that. Um, I have one uh, question here, which, um, um, by the way, uh, just for the audience who's listening in, you, please do look at the, the chat channel because both Colin and Jin have shared some resources for those people who had questions about access to additional content and material. Please have a look there. There are some links that will be shared there, and these will be available later. Uh, um, offline, as well as the summary of tonight's uh, presentation. I have one, um, we're coming up to time. I still have a, a set of questions here, which we'll have to take up offline, but there is one here for Colin, who you would like to answer directly. Um, um, would you like to uh, cover this uh, question, Colin, on how we can implement integrated water resource in international, et cetera, et cetera? Would you, you wanted to take that directly yourself? Yeah, sorry, I'm I'm tr uh, playing around with the technology, trying to get the. Uh, <laughs> Do you uh, want me to so read it for you? Yeah, you're referring to the water harvesting for human consumption, right? Uh, it's to. Um, no. Uh, yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Th if that one. So yeah, uh, I think um, we have often interacted with water as if it were uh, a linear resource. You know, it uh, it comes from somewhere. We use it, we throw it away, and then it's somebody else's problem. And I think we need to be start viewing water increasingly as uh, in a circular manner. Um, and I mean that means that we need to also take responsibility a little bit for reducing our, our impact on water resources, both in quality and quantity. Um, water harvesting can be a very good technique for that, um, especially in rural areas that are maybe a little bit uh, remote and difficult to get uh, more centralized piping systems too. Um, but uh, it can also be used, I mean, rainwater catchment systems, for example, in an urban context uh, with the benefit of reducing flood risk. So I think it's, it's, it's a very good technique, which for m many countries has not been prioritized. And I unfortunately don't have the answer as to why it hasn't been prioritized because it seems like such a, a simple um, system to implement and financially attractive and so on. 
Um, but I, I think this is this is something that uh, water users don't actually have to wait until uh, the government supports. We can also uh, take things into our own hands. And that's perhaps the final message I would leave you with on this topic. Thanks.